thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, speak today. Uh, this was a difficult topic. There isn't a, a whole lot of literature out there on the management of these patients, a lot of case reports. I tried to summarize what I could from what, I, what was available um, in the literature. I have no financial disclosures. Uh, this was a case that came to the university um, about six months ago. This was a 57-year-old female who underwent uh, catheter ablation for uh, proximal atrial fibrillation. She was diagnosed uh, four weeks following the procedure with a uh, atrial esophageal fistula when she presented with uh, a cerebrovascular uh, accident. She was taken to surgery by a uh, non-thoracic cardiac surgeon who did a left thoracotomy, primary closure of the esophagus. There was no mention in terms of uh, the, um, the management of the left atrium. Uh, he did suture some pleura to the esophagus. The patient subsequently had a recurrence and continued to have neurologic uh, injury. Uh, she was then subsequently had a CT scan that confirmed the continued uh, air in the left atrium, which is the best diagnostic test. She was then transferred to the university. My partner received the patient and took her to surgery. He was planning to place a stent. Uh, during the procedure, the patient had a um, seizure and subsequently coded and uh, passed away. So uh, let's just talk a little bit about atrial fibrillation first. It's a very common procedure. Three to five million people will have atrial fibrillation in the United States, uh, and that 2020 should have been 2050. By 2050, there, there's not, the numbers are gonna exceed eight million. Uh, currently, the only proven benefit of AFib ablation uh, remains the reduction of symptoms and the improvement in the quality of life. It's a class two uh, recommendation. Um, in terms of um, isolation of the pulmonary veins, that is the cornerstone of AFib ablation procedures. Um, this drawing um, depicts um, sort of where you typically see the lesion sets uh, and the origin of the atrial fibrillation. This is um, mostly um, in the left-sided and upper pulmonary veins. In terms of uh, techniques of uh, ablation, there's a variation in the um, uh, energy source as well as the lesion set, similar to you know, surgical ablation um, the, uh, during open heart surgery. Um, energy sources include radiofrequency ablation, uh, cryoablation, and laser. There's also a high frequency ultrasound. Um, the lesion uh, through a radio frequency ablation uh, will generate a heat up to 60 degrees Celsius cryoablation is usually administered through a left atrial balloon that occludes each pulmonary vein and freezes to minus 50 degrees. Uh, in the U.S., only RF ablation and uh, cryo ablation are proved. Um, location, in terms of the lesion sets, vary as well. The cardiologist will, or the electrophysiologist will divide patients into either paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or non-paroxysmal. Recall that uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is AFib that is less than seven days. Um, uh, the location of the lesions for typically paroxysmal atrial fibrillation will be the pulmonary vein orifices. And then uh, for non-paroxysmal, uh, you're looking at not only the orifices of the pulmonary vein, but the back of the left atrium, uh, lesion sets that might connect the pul superior pulmonary veins and the inferior pulmonary veins, the mitral annulus, and so forth. Uh, so some of the complications that one might see following um, atrial fibrillation ablation, you know, the overall incidence, I, I looked at some of the um, electrophysiology journals, it ranges, um, but generally about 6%, not a lot. Cardiac tamponade is the most lethal uh, or life-threatening complication. Um, atrial esophageal fistula formation, again, um, a wide range. Uh, from very low numbers to up around 1%. It may be an underreported entity uh, in the EP literature. Um, esoph esophageal injury um, can be seen following both RF ablation and cryoablation, uh, as well as other techniques. Um, and why is that? You know, a lot of these patients that undergo AFib ablation, uh, there'll be an enlargement of the left atrium. The contact between the left atrium and the esophagus is greater. The course of the esophagus along the posterior atrial wall may vary. Um, there may also be um, loss of some of the fatty planes and tissue planes between the atrium and the esophagus um, predisposing. And I just threw out this picture of a left thoracotomy just to show 
some of the relationships, you know, you have the spine that's not visualized back here, of course, the aorta on the left side, the inferior pulmonary vein, uh, pericardium in the left atrium up here, and the diaphragm down low. So the uh, pathophysiology of uh, atrial esophageal fistulization. Uh, when you look at the, the evidence that's uh, available, which is, again, very limited, there are four types of esophageal injury described. Uh, the most uh, esophageal hematoma is usually due to an intra-procedure TEE probe. Um, what we're talking about is an esophageal ulceration uh, or an esophageal pericardial fistula or an atrial esophageal fistula. Those are the three uh, other types. And um, this is a depiction sort of showing that the initial injury is not along the atrial wall. It's actually an esophagus. And so this can then subsequently um, progress to an ulceration that can then subsequently progress to an esophageal pericardial fistula and then subsequently to an atrial esophageal fistula. So there perhaps is a continuum of injury progression uh, among these patients. The clinical presentation, it's a delayed presentation, although sometimes you can see them earlier um, in a couple of days. Typically, it's going to be a week or longer as that injury continuum progresses. Um, fever is the most common symptom. Um, in one uh, paper, I found that it was about 75% of the patients uh, presented with the fever. Neurologic deficits are the second most common um, symptom. Um, and um, in, in one publication, the most common neurological deficits were postprandial TIAs, uh, grand mal seizures, and focal cortical signs. So I, I think, you know, um, anybody that presents with a fever and neurological symptoms, you have to really uh, make sure that they don't have this uh, entity. Uh, hematemesis is a, another uh, symptom, third most common, and usually those patients expire from massive hemorrhage. Uh, other things, other, other symptoms could be chest pain, or dynophagia, headache, cough. Um, and of course, the clinical picture is never clear, you know, the possibility could be pericarditis or an endocarditis. And so, you know, these are not easy, uh, um, this is not an easy condition to diagnose. Uh, in terms of diagnostic examinations, um, again, no, no one study is ideal. Uh, I would say uh, barium esophagram and endoscopy are probably contraindicated due to the risk of um, introducing air into the left atrium. Uh, CT scan of the chest appears to be the best initial test, um, looking for air within the left atrial cavity. And here's a couple of examples of, uh, this is very small, punctate little bit of air there, and then this is a little bit more obvious. Um, so looking for air within the left atrial cavity. Certainly you want to get a CT of the brain, look for an ischemic injury. Um, Transthoracic echocardiogram would also be important to evaluate for pericarditis, pericardial fluid, and possibly looking at the anterior heart valves. Um, treatment. Again, there's, there's not a lot of um, guidance. Um, when I looked at all the uh, case reports and some of the publications within the uh, Heart Rhythm Society, um, EP uh, papers, basically you could break, break up treatment into three uh, broad categories. There's esophageal stenting. Now, I would not recommend that uh, for an atrial esophageal fistula. However, if you have an isolated perforation without an atrial communication, that may be an option. Esophageal diversion, again, um, a couple of case reports uh, published looking at pos uh, uh, diverting the esophagus, um, and then there's surgical uh, treatment modalities. And again, surgery, there's a potpourri of surgical options here as well. What I did was I went through um, as many case reports as I could find between 210 and 217. Um, where the outcome of the patient was clearly defined and the procedure was somewhat clearly defined in the, uh, in the body of the text. And uh, I only uncovered 20 patients, but these are the most uh, common procedures that I found. Um, left thoracotomy, repair the left atrium using an extra pericardial approach with primary repair of the esophagus um, was the most common procedure reported with uh, some success. Uh, left thoracotomy with repair of the atrium using femoral bypass uh, right thoracotomy, repair of the atrium using femoral bypass, and then primary repair of the esophagus. I think if you're going to go in the right chest, you have to be able to put them on bypass. You're not going to get to the left atrium. 
uh, sternotomy, repair of the left atrium using conventional bypass, then uh, thoracotomy either on the right side or the left side, and then uh, some of the, some of the um, papers had uh, been a position of vascularized muscle such as, or vascularized tissue such as omentum, the latissimus dorsi uh, muscle uh, or the intercostal muscle, and autologous pericardium. So just a, a host of, opportun um, of options, but um, um, in this paper, um, looking at, uh, this was another paper sort of analyzing case reports in 53 patients, um, and they found that the interval between the procedure, the AFib ablation and the presentation was about 20 days, younger patient population. Um, they did not find, um, I'm sorry, uh, about 41 percent, uh, 41 patients had a um, percutaneous AFib ablation and 12 patients had a, a surgical uh, ablation. Um, and again, I didn't mention this earlier, but this is an entity you can see after open heart surgery as well if you're doing an atrial lesion set. In fact, I think the first, first case was an open heart procedure um, out of Cleveland Clinic where they described the esophageal injury. Um, there was no difference in this, in this small paper on ter in terms of mortality between those patients that had surgical versus percutaneous. What they did find was that the patients that had a primary esophageal repair had a better outcome than those that did not. Now, I don't know what the did not group uh, exactly had in this publication, but um, so, you know, surgery, if you can take the patient to the operating room, would be the best option for the patient based on, on this. Um, so in, in, in sort of a summary in terms of operative approaches, uh, this is, you know, my two cents. Uh, there's no consensus on the best operative approach. Certainly a left thoracotomy is advantageous, so you have better access to the posterior left atrium without the use of uh, the, uh, peripheral femoral bypass. I would certainly have a cardiac surgeon available uh, in the operating theater to help. Um, primary repair of the atrium with uh, pericardium, um, purse string suture, pledgeted sutures, all of those techniques uh, were, um, have been applied successfully. Um, interposing vas uh, then primary repair of the esophagus, uh, interposing vascularized tissue, muscle, or momentum, and then, of course, um, mediastinal debridement, drainage, feeding tube, having the cardiopulmonary um, bypass on standby with the ability to do peripheral cannulation. Now, uh, just a couple words on uh, approaches to minimize risk uh, of the esophagus during uh, ablation. Um, certainly, you can. Um, um, reduce the power delivery to the posterior left atrial wall. Uh, you can monitor the esophageal temperature. Um, most of the evidence uh, states that maintain, maintaining the esophageal temperature below 40 degrees Celsius is, could minimize the risk of uh, esophageal injury. Pharmacologic prophylaxis has been described uh, using uh, proton pump inhibitors. As you'll, as you'll see on the next slide, the incidence of esophageal injury is, is significant. Um, something I didn't really appreciate until I looked into this. Um, and ulcerations, uh, evidence of esophagitis, things like that are sometimes found in PPIs may be a benefit here. Thermal insulation of the esophagus with a balloon catheter. Um, this is an invasive uh, approach where you actually put a balloon in the pericardial space, interpose it between the left atrial wall. So of course you're introducing additional risk to the patient in doing something like this. Um, esophageal displacement. Uh, so this is a couple of pictures using uh, showing a, a TE probe, and these authors showed how you could move the esophagus, uh, Porter Starboard, to to uh, take them away, take the esophagus away from the uh, pulmonary vein lesion areas uh, to minimize risk. And this this is um, you know the role of endoscopic screening for ulceration following AFib ablation is unclear. Um, there's a variety of uh, post-ablation uh, incidents uh, can vary quite a bit, but it's significant. And in this uh, registry study, which I found was very interesting, of 832 patients who underwent uh, AFib ablation, these, all of these patients underwent um, an EGD seven days after the procedure. And they found 150 patients, or 18%, that demonstrated esophageal injury, esophageal lesions. Um, most of these were minor lesions 
such as uh, erythema or possibly some superficial ulceration, but 52%, 6% had an, a significant ulceration. And of these 6%, I'm oh, sorry, uh, of these five patients went on to develop a perforation or an atrial esophageal fistula. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what the role of uh, endoscopic surveillance, you know, is right now. Um, certainly that's, that's something that's actively being uh, investigated um, and um, more to follow on that. So uh, in summary, some of the key points, probably we'll see more atrial esophageal fistulas as, as more patients undergo ablation for AFib. Um, we have to maintain a high index of suspicion in any patient with a history of ablation who presents with a fever and neurologic symptoms. CT scan of the thorax looking for a left atrial air is probably the best uh, initial examination. Again, we can argue about the best surgical approach, but probably a left thoracotomy with primary repair of the esophagus and the atrium with interposing muscle appears to provide the best results in terms of survival for the patient. Uh, I didn't really talk about the neurologic injuries, but long-term outcome is certainly determined by the degree of neurologic uh, recovery in these patients. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity.